Greetings BMW Motorrad fans, Andy Jukes here and welcome to our first ever live podcast. Thanks for joining us wherever you're watching. Welcome to my engine room or humble home office, virtually, virtually at least. So why are we doing a live podcast? Well, because of the current situation we can't all be together as usual and it's making us a little crazy, driving us around the bend as they say. No shows, no exhibitions, no press launches, no BMW Motorrad days, can you believe that? And still no group riding for many of us, lockdown fever or what? So we thought, let's use the technology at our, our disposal to try and bring us all together to talk bikes, specifically the new R18. So what are, what are we going to be doing? Well, first of all, we're going to be chatting with Timo Resch, Vice President of Sales and Marketing of BMW Motorrad as well as Trudy Hardy, VP of BMW Motorrad of the Americas. Then we're going to bring in some familiar faces from the Bavarian Soul Story series, including Tommy Kearns, Alan Stolberg, Kate Nettesheim and Nat Natalie Gessler. They're here to answer your questions, so if there's anything you want to know, now's your chance. Get posting. We've got a team over in Munich watching the feed and pressing lots of buttons, We've got me at my home office in the UK and our friends in New York, New Jersey, Texas and California waiting in the wings. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, it already seems like an age. More than two months ago, I believe, that the series production R18 was unveiled. Not the usual world premiere, of course, but as live via BMW Motorrad's social media channels. Close on a quarter of a million of you tuned into that. And there's so much interest out there that we felt compelled to keep the conversation going as best as we can. So we're bringing our special guests together today to talk in more detail about this bike and to try and satisfy your curiosity until it arrives in your backyard, so to speak. Our plan is to do several of these live podcasts over the next few months, possibly even more if you like them. The live format allows for a bit of interactivity. So I'd like to put a big shout out for questions from your side. If there's anything you want to know about the R18, do get in touch with us and ask anyway, and we'll do our best to give you an answer during the show. Anyway, that's enough chat from my side for now. Before we introduce our first two guests, let's get your soul stirred with a short clip of the bike everyone's talking about. Welcome back! From Munich, we're delighted to welcome Timo Resch, Vice President of Sales and Marketing, BMW Motorrad. And from New Jersey, it's a warm welcome to Trudy Hardy, VP of BMW Motorrad of the Americas. Hey guys, great to have you here. Hey, thanks for having us. Hello, thank you Most for welcome. having me. So, if we can start with you first, Timo. You've had a deep involvement in steering the development of the long-awaited R18. So to see the series production version finally unveiled must have been a huge moment for you. Huge moment are probably uh, words that cannot really describe it. For me, since I started with BMW Motorrad, it has been a very, very interesting and a very special story. So um, being involved from the very early days of sketching this bike and talking to the designers, talking to the engineers, it has been something at the beginning you can't really believe that at some point it's coming together and then have been uh, on test bikes uh, riding around uh, to get a feeling for what the bike is like, if our customers will appreciate it, to now, just two months ago, see the final bike in its uh, full uh, shine, uh, getting in front of the eyes of our customers. It's, it's hard, it's really touching my heart. It's very special. Totally understand that, yeah. Well, you're well known as a passionate motorcyclist across many segments, Timo, but, but this is an entirely different area of focus for the brand. Can you explain exactly what it means for BMW Motorrad to enter this new segment with the R18? Entering a new segment always has been something very special for BMW Motorrad. And I personally compare it with um, us entering the super sport segment. So two segments that are completely uh, separate from each other, the cruisers and the super sport bikes. 
But what BMW did in 2009 when we entered the supersport market was something that no one really expected BMW to do. And it opened the door to new customers to a completely new level of the brand, what the brand stands for. And I think we are doing exactly that again now in 2020, 11 years later with the R18, because it's really opening up the brand BMW Motorrad to customers or potential customers who potentially never thought about the brand BMW Motorrad before. And for that uh, reason, it's very exciting for us. Goodness me, is it 11 years since we, <laughs> since we first saw the double R? It's incredible how time flies, isn't it? Anyway, back to the R18. This is the highest capacity motorcycle boxer engine ever produced. How important is the size and the characteristics of the engine within this segment? I think the engine is the defining factor of this bike, of motorcycles, I think in general, but even more so of this specific bike. And what is most important next to size is the authenticity. To have a bike from BMW in the segment, there is no other engine choice than a boxer engine. And for that reason, even though in the very early days of this project, there were some wild ideas about what engine configuration should become the engine of such a bike, it was very early clear, like nothing else, that it has to be a boxer engine and it has to be the biggest boxer engine ever done from BMW. So for that reason, it's about the 1.8 liter displacement. It's about all the torque that the engine uh, can deliver, which really makes it stand out. Yeah, it's about no compromises, isn't it? All the way through. So I've heard you've already been riding the R18 Timo. Lucky you. Now, there's a huge amount of interest, of course, in the big boxer, but the question on everybody's lips is exactly what is it like to ride? So what can you tell us? We want to know everything from the sound of the engine to the enormous torque to the way the whole package makes you feel out on the road. I think, first of all, you, have, you cannot really put it into words. For that reason, I would like to invite everyone as soon as the bike will be available at the dealers or at test ride possibilities to really find that out for yourself. But obviously, it's very much driven by the sound. This segment is defined by the sound and it does not necessarily mean that it has to be very loud, but it has to be an authentic, a very deep and a very, a very emotional sound. And this is definitely a fact given this big engine and the exhaust treatment that we have. At the same time, the bike feels surprisingly nimble. I think this is something, a bike that comes from BMW, even in the cruiser segment, people expect that this bike handles well. It has a very, very decent brakes, actually, maybe not as aggressive as you would expect on a double R, as we have mentioned this bike before, but you can really feel that a lot of engineering power went into this bike and you can really have fun on this bike, just cruising along, relaxing, or actually being a little bit more engaged and really finding out what it means with such a cool bike to ride the curvy roads that you actually would ride with such a bike. So it's a very entertaining, at the same time, relaxing ride. Relaxing ride. Okay, just going a little bit deeper into that, because on our social media channels, we've had a lot of interesting questions about what the ideal seating position could be for a bike like the R18. So can you tell us a little bit more about the thinking that, that went into this important topic during the bike's development by the design and the engineering teams, I guess, and how, how good you actually found those results out on the road? And I think uh, let's, let's not try to talk about the, the pink elephant in the room. Yes, compared to some other bike in the segment, there are two cylinders which are sticking out on the BMW, which make it authentic and unique. But as you have probably seen in this short video clip before, the riding position itself was something that a lot of, let's say, thinking, a lot of testing went into. And from all types of riders, from 1 meter 50, 1 meter 55, all the way to 2 meters, we had test riders on this bike to find out, is it comfortable? Is it really a relaxing seating position or is it something that you don't really feel comfortable with? And that's uh, what I can, I can speak for the 1 meter 95 test riders because I have put a couple of miles on this bike it's actually very relaxing to sit on this bike. And this is, I think, something that is um, very, very unique to a boxer engine, that you have a riding position that is a little bit more engaging than just to put your feet forward, which actually, if you want to do that, you can still do that. But obviously, it, it helps you to also have a little bit more control over the bike. So for that reason, riding position was something that a lot of thinking, a lot of testing went into, and I'm very happy with the final outcome. Super. Good to know. Good to know. So. We're going to go into much more detail about design and customization in future episodes of this podcast. But just from your perspective, how well do you feel the series production R18 
has met its original design ambitions, you know, as seen in those first initial sketches. I think there are a lot of really very true BMW DNA uh, themes that go from the first sketches through the concept bikes all the way into the serial production engine. If you look at the frame, the frame is a very, very typical, also very traditional BMW frame type and also the form of the frame. And I think this is something that is very unique to BMW and it's actually, as you can see in this picture, perfectly integrated into the R18. Also the shape of the tank is something that this uh, drop shape of the tank is something that actually was uh, very unique to BMW for a very long time. And obviously on a cruiser bike like that, it's the perfect opportunity to bring this back to life. Also other ideas that were very early um, initiated, like the open uh, drive shaft, which are also something that are very, very authentic and very historically connected in BMW DNA, made it all the way into the serial production bike. And this is something that the designers as well as the engineers and us finally interacting with our customers are very proud to actually have this in our serial production bike all the way through. Yeah, looking good. And just touching briefly on customization and personalization options, I'm interested to know what the ideal Timo Resch R18 would look like. <laughs> Actually, there are so many different opportunities to make this bike really your personal very unique R18, it's really very difficult to define. And I hope that a lot of you out there already took the opportunity to use our configurator to really find out what are the specific um, accessories, what are the specific options that you would like to see. I was um, a little bit involved in picking these four bikes that have been used on this uh, photo shooting where we saw these really nice clips come out. So on the one side you see a very, I'm very intrigued by the look of the, of the um, of something that gives you a little bit more uh, a special look compared to, let's say, other brands out there. And I think for that reason, something like the, 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 like the look of this ape hanger that you have seen on these pictures might look like it's not really comfortable to sit on that. But if you put yourself on this bike and you see yourself riding this, this is a unique feeling. Obviously, at the same time, um, seeing such a bike riding, you would never expect this to be a BMW. So this is... I, I would say the most surprising look that I think is very intriguing and I could definitely see myself on this bike. Maybe I would not just count in for one bike. I think uh, at least two or three bikes. So the configuration of the four that you've seen, I think they give you a real good idea of, let's say, a, a feeling of in what different directions you could take this bike and make it a very, very special bike for yourself, a personalized R18. Yeah, or maybe more than one bike for yourself, depending on what mood you're in. So, <laughs> so all possible, all possibilities there. So thanks ever so much, Timo. There have been some great insights there. And I'd like to bring uh, you into the conversation now, Trudy, to get a US perspective on things. Thanks for joining us all the way from the States. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Well, what an exciting time to be VP of BMW Motor out of the Americas, especially with a bike like this on the way. It is beyond exciting for so many reasons. I've been an avid rider for my entire adult life. Um, I've also worked for BMW Group for 20 years. So to be able to bring my passion for the brand and the passion that I have for riding together and bring your personal passion together uh, you know, with your day-to-day -day career is really a dream come true. And I would also say that Timo and I have worked together for several years on the car side. So it's really nice to be back together with Timo on the motorcycle side. It's always nice to work together with people you admire and respect. So, uh, so exciting for me for so many different reasons. Yeah, great to you both find your way to motorcycles. <laughs> so it's a whole new market segment that BMW Motorrad is going to be addressing with this bike, Trudy. It's just how big is the scope of people that you feel you can reach with the R18 in the USA? Well, to put it in perspective, I think we sold 67,000 motorcycles in the cruiser segment in 2019. So that is nearly one in every four motorcycle sales is one in the cruiser segment. So it is a huge opportunity uh, for BMW and I would also say to our core BMW fans as well. So we're not only attracting 
audiences uh, from, that have never considered us before, but this is also something highly desirable for our BMW fans as well. Wow, that is a, a huge amount of untapped potential in the US market for BMW Motorrad, that's for sure. So, and of course, this big first ever big box of cruises is geared towards your riders. So how does it feel to be part of this latest chapter in the brand's history? Well, no pressure, I guess, right? So coming in, uh, I've got a big responsibility in what we need to deliver here for the United States, but I think it's, it's an amazing challenge. It's an amazing opportunity for us. And I think it's, it's really exciting to bring kind of the, the, the premium motorcycle that we've been known for and to enter the space. I think it's, it's unique that it offers authentic BMW heritage, but it's wrapped in a modern design package with great technology. So um, it's an amazing, amazing opportunity for us and uh, really looking forward to getting started in the second half of the year. Yeah, I mean, I don't need to tell you that BMW bikes, they're all about the riding experience, not just parking up and looking at. But do you feel like the R18 can stir the senses on both levels, Trudy? Well, I guess the first thing that I would say is don't underestimate the cruiser target audience. And I think while they enjoy the community aspect of motorcycling, they are very much a segment that really enjoys riding, especially here in the United States. They are one of the top segments in terms of how many miles they put on their bike. So it's not only important, I think, the aesthetics and the way that the bike looks, but the riding uh, performance and the technology will be very important to this audience. They don't mind scraping their pegs through the canyon roads. They put a tremendous amount of miles. They've got a lot of seat time. And performance will also be an important part for them. I think, you know, they, they're really looking for some of the the performance uh, features, but also comfort features. So if we look at active stability control and hill assist and reverse assist and all the great technology that we've brought to this bike, I think that will really, really offer a tremendous package for people looking in this segment. Absolutely. I mean, love all those advanced features, but I just want to talk about history rather than the future just for a minute, because of course, in recent years, BMW Motor has really been focused on embracing and celebrating its own history. I mean, you've got the heritage lineup of bikes and clothing that's been very successful. And of course, now you've got this new R18 that draws its inspiration from, well, I guess the past nine decades of Motorrad history. This brand authenticity, do you feel that's important for American riders? I absolutely think it's important. I mean, the motorcycle that we choose makes a huge statement about ourselves and our own personality. Um, but also thinking about the German engineering that goes into our brand, I think that there's huge expectations on us in terms of that brand authenticity. But I think that's what we're known for. And I think no worries, we'll be able to deliver that. And a lot of people here, I think, especially in, in the United States, don't realize that we were making motorcycles before we made cars. And I think looking back to the heritage of the R5 and some of those design cues and, and the authenticity of our roots that have been built into the DNA of the R18, it, it really gives us great communication points here in the United States and to educate uh, those that may know us more from the cars we build, but know a little bit less on the motorcycle side. So I think that's a huge opportunity for us on the communication side. Yeah, huge indeed. Now, as a passionate rider yourself, I understand that you are passionate about tapping into the growing female market for motorcycling. So the R18, do you feel it's going to also appeal to female riders in the States and beyond the States even? Uh, yeah, 20% um, of all riders here in the United States are female. So one in five, it gives us a, a really big opportunity. It's a growing segment for us. So it's something that you see increasing every year. And I think, you know, for, for women, ride height is an important part of feeling comfortable on the bike. I'm quite tall, so I don't worry about that as much as others. But I think the low seating position, the low center of gravity with the bike, that that's really going to offer women um, a comfort level when they get on the R18. Um, I think also the balance and the stability of this motorcycle for those that are in the cruiser space. I'm really excited to get female riders uh, on the bike and, and you know, experience is everything. 
Uh, but I think some of your upcoming guests might be able to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, Natalie and Kate may be able to uh, give you a little bit more insight on being, you know, kind of a female rider and what their experience was like. But I think this is a huge opportunity for us. Yeah, that looked like uh, Natalie on that picture of the R18 <laughs> there. So we're going to talk to we're going to talk to her later. Listen, thanks, Trudy. It's really interesting to get the American angle on the R18. Before you both leave us, Timo and Trudy, I'd like to introduce a couple of questions from our fans who are watching. If the tech works, we should be able to see them on screen shortly. Ah, here we go. Okay, I'm going to ask you this one, Timo. Um, Apparently there are riding modes called Rock, Roll and Rain. I understand what Rain would be, but can you tell me what the differences between all those modes are, please? <laughs> and I think um, for us at BMW Motor, obviously we have a history of riding modes that actually are tailored to the very specific setup of a couple of the systems of the bike that you can fine tune. When we uh, discussed uh, the riding modes for the cruiser segment, we really thought about what is really important to these kind of customers. And Obviously, the one thing to have kind of this feeling of, yes, everything is detuned a little bit on the safe side, you need to have the rain mode. But who actually wants to ride around in the rain mode? So for that reason, we have two modes that really offer the two, let's say, areas of this bike. Roll is like the mode, is describing this kind of easy, um, cool, relaxed riding, which gives you all the performance if you want it, but you are not really engaged with the bike so directly. And the rock mode is actually the one where you get a lot more instant throttle response. And this really accelerates the, the heart rate when you sit on the bike to quite a high level because it's very instantaneous. This bike really gives you feedback to a degree that you would not really expect that such a bike can give you. And we thought when we were coming up uh, with the names for these modes that, yes, it's a little bit cheeky on the one side, but at the same time, I think it's describing very well what these modes stand for. So roll to roll along and to rock if you really want to have a lot of fun rock and roll i love it who came up with the names actually i have to give these uh, credits to my boss to our head of bmw motorrad <laughs> markus so he he said it feels like rock and it feels like roll we said hey let's name it <laughs> oh great be, be fantastic to have him on the podcast at a later date Okay, I think we've got a question about uh, USA dealerships here. Um, so I'm going to ask this one to Trudy. When are these bikes arriving in the US dealerships? And that's from Thomas Fink, if you know him. Okay, so we're looking at uh, an arrival and an on-sale date in September of this year. So very excited about that. Our dealer first supply, uh, as well as some customer pre-orders. We launched a pre-order website, so our dealer first supply and fulfilling those early pre-orders to customers will happen in September. Superb. Well, that's not too long to wait. Not, not too, too long far to away. Wait. <laughs> Superb. Okay, we've got another question on the screen coming up. Okay, this is from, I hope I've got this right, Cody. Cody Kutenhofer, I've probably said that wrong. Um, I'm gonna ask this one to Timo. Timo, is the R18 only going to be built in Berlin? Yes, Berlin is the, our main uh, factory in our entire network of BMW Motorrad where most of our bikes are being built. And the R18 actually proudly also showing this actually in a couple of details of the bike where you see Berlin built, for example, in the tech. So um, it's Berlin built, uh, all of the bikes are built in Berlin and we are very happy to keep this tradition ongoing with these, um, all our high capacity bikes coming out of our Berlin factory. So it's the case, yes. Okay, thanks for that, Timo. I'm gonna move things on there because we've got quite a few more guests waiting in the wing. So listen, a massive thanks to both Timo and Trudy for joining us live today. We really appreciate your time. We look forward to seeing you both in person at a motorcycling event soon. Fingers crossed. Us Bye as well. for now, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. See you soon. Thanks to everyone. Bye. Okay. Right then, on to the second part of our live podcast. And I'd like to bring in some new guests, some of whom will be quite familiar, as you'll see from this next clip. Coming out of downtown was just beautiful. Getting to get getting out of that straightaway and seeing the mountains on the side. Finally, oh, getting to ride, huh? Yeah. I think BMW needs to invent air conditioning next. Eight hangers. 
with air conditioning. Oh, yeah. Totally. I'm going to prove to you just how much I like you. I'm going to buy you a Oh, a, oh. a wrap. Oh, a wrap. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so what we got here? Looks like we got wraps and we got dogs. How long's the wait? Yeah. <laughs> pretty busy over here. Yeah. Oh, is that it? Oh, I could wa I could watch that all day. Okay, <laughs> let me just introduce you to uh, each of our guests briefly. So. Most people watching will know Tommy Kearns. Give him a wave, Tommy. He's the host of A Bavarian Soul Story. That was a YouTube series that documented the R18's journey from concept to serial production. Uh, he's traveled all over the world making that show, right across Europe, the USA, and even down to South Africa. So he's probably the best person to ask about the excitement levels across the globe within the motorcycle community for the imminent arrival of this new R18. Uh, it's pretty early in California right now, so he's probably had to set his alarm for this one. How are you doing, Tommy? Doing well, Andy. Good to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you. Okay, Natalie Gessler. Where are you, Natalie? Are you in there somewhere? Hi there. Yeah, there she is. She's a project lead for the marketing and communication of all R18 activity globally. And it was Natalie who actually dreamed up the concept of the Bavarian Soul Story in the first place. So good call there, Natalie. You'll know by now that this series has, of course, really ignited interest in the big boxer and has helped us all understand the R18's heritage and, and links to so many important models over the past 97 years of the brand's history. So it was seriously entertaining viewing, of course. So, hey, Natalie, great to see you again. Hey, Andy. <laughs> There's Alan. Alan Stolberg. How are you doing, Alan? All right. How are you? Good, good. Alan's the founder of Revival Cycles, based in Austin, Texas. He's been riding and spannering motorcycles since he was about five years old. And following a brief spell in the corporate world, now does exactly what he loves for a living. Um, as part of the pre-launch campaign for the R18, it was BMW Motorrad who tasked Revival Cycles with building their own custom bike based around the prototype Big Boxer motor. Revival was only one of two motorcycle design houses globally given the opportunity to create its own vision. Now and his team blew our minds with the birdcage. Remember that? Well, who can forget the unforgettable design study? There were hundreds of individually welded pieces of titanium and almost entirely fabricated or one-off machined and hand-built parts. More on that later. Thanks for coming on the live podcast, Alan. Sure, thank you. Pleased to be here. So... That brings us on to Kate. Now, when you've got a father who's been collecting BMW motorcycles for over 40 years, it's hard not to be swept along with his amazing journey, especially when the family home actually becomes the museum. So Kate Nettesheim, she's a seriously passionate rider in her own right, though, and she's a fan of all kinds of BMW bikes from all eras. She'll also be a familiar face to many thousands of you who enjoyed a Bavarian Soul Story. Welcome, Kate. How's it going? Good. Just checking your mic's working there. Anyway, let's go over to uh, let's go over and have a chat with Tommy first. Tommy, it's been a whirlwind twelve months for you, and your acting and hosting skills have gone through the roof. Uh, as has your profile. So, have you had any movie offers yet, mate? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no movie offers just yet in the, in, in the pipeline, but it's, uh, it's been funny watching the progression from episode one to episode eight or episode nine, uh, just kind of being more comfortable with the camera. But I've had a few people kind of come out of the woodwork and be like, well, what's next now that you've done this? I'm like, I, I don't really know. I, I, uh, I never really thought of hosting or, you know, an on-camera talent would ever be something that I would be doing, but it, it's been a really cool and fun experience. So, you know, definitely talking to Natalie and seeing where the Bavarian Soul Story kind of goes from there, and just kind of really enjoying coming into my uh, coming into my my comfort zone behind the camera now, I guess so to say. <laughs> yeah, well, we've really enjoyed watching you ease into your role of frontman of that series. It's not easy, is it, having cameras, lights, even pushy directors in your face, is it? So I guess the real experience has been a, a real steep learning curve for you. It's definitely been a learning curve. And I, it's funny going from, you know, episode one to episode, you know, 
nine or ten. How uh, I've lost count because we've shot so many at this point. But uh, going from a you know a small kind of a hotel room doing our kind of one-on-ones with the camera and as soon as that red light comes on everybody in the room just kind of freezes and starts looking at you and um the directors have always been great uh no one has ever been pushy it's been very very comfortable and, and very organic and that was one of the things that i was i always kind of questioned natalie and, and some of the the crew it's like how do we want this it's just like it, just like we're having a conversation. So it's been very natural, very organic. It's never been scripted, you know. It's been very passionate, and that's been something that's continued throughout the entire storyline. So um, it's been easy and comfortable. And I just remember one scene shooting uh, right before that clip that we just showed. Um, at one point, there's 70 people off camera, and I was able to just kind of go <laughs> through the scene really quickly. But you know, <laughs> rewind about eight or nine months earlier and I was freaking out because there was two guys behind the camera staring at me asking me questions and I was like a deer in headlights. So it's been very interesting watching the whole storyline kind of progress and just kind of coming into my own skin and comfort zone in front of the camera. Yeah, absolutely. I think we should uh, plan some live episodes in. That's an, that's another uh, good <laughs> challenge that I'm sure you'd be able to rise to. But in terms of challenges, what would you say were the biggest challenges during the production of this series? Uh, some of the biggest challenges were probably learning German and, and Italian in real time, uh, asking <laughs> asking people questions and then kind of looking at you like, oh, you don't speak English, and I, I don't speak, obviously, <laughs> German or Italian. So uh, yeah. being at ICMA and asking people questions and they just look at you like, what? Or uh, kind of having on-camera kind of banter and jokes uh, with somebody who doesn't speak, obviously, English as their first language. So sometimes humor and, and things like that may were kind of lost in translation. Um, but I would say, you know, all things aside, it was very easy because uh, having communication with, with a lot of the people because, again, passion was always in the, at the forefront. But um, really just getting over the fear of once that red light turns on, of getting comfortable and not feeling like it was a scripted commercial. This was a very organic kind of progression throughout all of these, all of these episodes. Yeah, you mentioned passion there, and that's something that I just want to mm -hmm. just go a little bit deeper into because, of course, over the course of the series, You've also become a BMW Motrad expert. Well, you had to, really. It was all down to you. So did it seem at times overwhelming to see just how much passion, knowledge, and love there is for the brand? Because there are some very special people out there, eh? Very special people. And I am by no means a BMW expert, but I will say that is something that I have enjoyed getting educated on through the series, getting to be in episode one with Fred and at the museum. Um, just blowing my mind and then I mean no matter what your hobbies are you there's always going to be people that that know more and you know are just like have obviously made more passion than you and it's funny I remember when we were at Barber talking to somebody they're like oh I know this taillight is off of this year bike and those engine covers and this breastplate are off of this year because of the fins and it's just like those small little details just show you how fanatical you know the the BMW culture is and it's just like getting to meet people like Peter who have collected bikes for 40 plus years and have you know have just a vast amount of knowledge is is just speaks volumes about the brand and I can tell you there's we met people everywhere in every place that we shot that shared that passion and it's something that I had never seen personally I I've been in the in the car world and in the bike world myself for many many years, but just seeing the amount of passion, specifically from BMW fans, is is something really special. And it was fun getting to kind of communicate with those people and vibe with them and get get their knowledge and their passion and just share stories. It's it's been really interesting. Yeah, passion's there one hundred percent. And as for knowledge, you know, you don't didn't don't know what you don't know until until you start talking to some of those. Uh, guys but let's just talk about Definitely. the ride experience briefly because of course the producers kept you waiting such a long time before letting you or anyone else in fact loose on the r18 so tell us tommy was it worth the wait it was very much worth the wait and you know i mean i am one of the very lucky few that got to ride the concept bike and i can't tell you how many people would come up 
both on camera and off camera asking me what that experience was. And then they're like, well, what is the real bike ride like? And I had never gotten to see the real bike until that final reveal, you know, in our most recent episode. And um, it's Timo and Trudy hit on it very, very well. Timo said it's nimble. You know, you would not think this bike might not be as nimble as it is once you finally get to ride it because it's a little bit longer. It does have a little bit of weight, but the bike is a very nimble ride considering, you know, it is in that cruiser segment and how Trudy mentioned with the performance, it's that boxer motor that, you know, it has that low end torque through all of the gears. You know, it's, I mean, you could pull away from a stoplight in third gear. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's that boxer motor torque and performance that, you know, and love. And I've gotten to ride some of the older boxers. So it's just like, it has all of those same characteristics and it definitely, hits on all cylinders for sure once you get to get on it and open it up once you get to get on it you're a lucky guy tommy anyway we'll let you get some <laughs> breakfast you. soon <laughs> we'll let you get some breakfast soon but uh, stay with us now please while we move over to natalie so natalie thanks first of all for all your creative input bavarian soul story it was a great concept you came up with there i'm just wondering how you managed to sell the idea of this youtube series to the to your bosses <laughs> Well, first of all, my pleasure. Um, I remember when I first started uh, to take over the responsibility for the R18 communication, I found out that there is like so many stories and so many people, so many thoughts, ideas, like so much passion behind that project. I knew that this has to be told. Um, so I was convinced that we have to really do a series about it. And um, when you're convinced and, convinced and passionate about something, it's easy to sell it to someone else. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, it's gone down extremely well across the globe. Can you give us some indication how many people have been watching it and where? Yeah, that's true. It was very successful, uh, which of course makes me really happy. And there was many excited, like millions of excited people watching it, um, watching Tommy on his way, um, finding, more, uh, find, finding out more about the R18. Um, but they were not only watching it, but also really getting in touch with us and um, sending us feedback, sending us comments and questions. So this was really fun. And I think Tommy also had the same experience, like as he said before, there is just so much going on um, beside these episodes, like so much connection. Yeah, there was, it was like a community mm -hmm. within a community. Yep. And, and of course, I guess the recent reveal episode was, was the most successful in terms of overall viewers. Yep. That's true. Like we have been teasing the R18 like so long. So it, um, it's no wonder that this was the uh, most successful episode. Yeah, well, it's great for me to finally see you in front of the camera because <laughs> I, I know how much work you put into this behind the scenes. But how, how nervous were you for the riding shots? Obviously, you know, no one wants to be the first one in the group to drop a new bike, especially as I guess you didn't have a single spare one kicking about at the time. <laughs> Yeah, well, this was a really cool experience for me, definitely. Totally new, like total new challenge for me, but um, I really like challenges. And um, yeah, when my boss told me first time that he wants me to be uh, on camera this time, I first thought that he was choking. But um, when I found out that he didn't, um, I, was, I was really excited. Um, and I also still remember that moment when I was sitting on the R18 first time. It was in Cape Town, so in the middle of the city, and I was sitting on the bike. I think it was like it was very warm, like 25 degrees or something. And it was not only warm, but I was also sitting underneath a tent because the bike was still secret, so we had to hide it. I was sitting underneath a tent, fully geared, like full protection gear, sitting on the bike, of course being nervous, like my heart was beating. And as it was still secret, I had to wait for the security to tell me to go. And as Tommy also said, like there were 80 or 70, 80 people waiting for that moment, of course, because everyone wanted to finally get that shooting going, like see the bike on the road and finally start shooting it. So, yeah, but it was, yeah, I was excited. Like, as I said, I still feel it like my heart was beating. But as soon as I got uh, going, um, yeah, I was super happy. And actually, I was proud. Like, it's such a cool, cool feeling to ride this bike. Yeah, well done, you. It's, it, it's interesting to see you on that picture because, of course, the R18 is <laughs> a big bike, but it still looks easy to ride, you know, like it carries its weight nice and low. Is it suitable for men and, and women of all shapes and sizes to ride, from, from your opinion and Tommy's and whoever else has slung a leg over that bike? 
Yeah, so it's the biggest boxer model in the brand's history. So it's a big, massive bike, but everything is in its place. And um, you intuitively, um, or, or everything happens intuitively. Like there is, it, it looks big, but it's really easy to ride and really, really enjoyable. Yeah, well said. Well, mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed a Bavarian soul story, but I don't want the journey to end personally. So what comes next, Natalie? Is there any inside information, any plans for anything else? Just, yeah, give us something, reveal something. Come on. <laughs> it's not the end, it's the beginning. Finally, the bike is here. So of course we are going on. Um, there is a lot happening behind the scenes or um, in our offices. I can't tell you any details, of course, but it's going on and it's going to be exciting and fun for sure. Good stuff. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that little snippet of information, Natalie. So, okay, let's move back from Munich to the States and over to Alan, who's patiently waiting for us uh, in Texas. Is it Alan? Yes, sir. In Austin. Austin, Texas. So, <coughs> cast your mind back when BMW Motorrad came to you all those months ago with a huge prototype engine that had never been seen in public before. Your eyes must have lit up. And, of course, then to get full creative freedom that's surely a bike builder's dream isn't it yeah i'd say um i was pretty excited i got to the chance to go to bmw uh, in berlin i'm sorry in uh, munich and see their the pre-production mock-ups uh and it was was shared they shared with me what it was going to look like in the end but but uh the only goal that i had was to make something that didn't look anything like what they'd made so uh, that's there's a lot of pressure involved in that, and I mean that uh, trying to think completely outside of the box of of any production box or any production bike that's ever been made, and then of course try to put my own stamp on it was uh, was exciting, but obviously intimidating right up front. Yeah, did you know right from the beginning which direction you were going? Uh, I'd love to say I did, <laughs> but no, I had no idea where I was headed at all. <laughs> Uh, right up until probably about eight, nine weeks before it was finished. I didn't really know where I was going to go. I had to change course a few times um, because you want to build something that makes a huge impact. Um, the main, uh, the main uh, goal that I had, which was given you by BMW, was to really um, uh, display the engine in a way that made it the centerpiece and the, the focal point of the build. So it just seemed obvious after, you know, a few, I don't know, a year's worth of thought. <laughs> One day it just kind of occurred to me that um, uh, making it seem as though the engine was floating in the middle of the chassis was, was the direction to head. And that, that meant, uh, you know, small tubing, that meant uh, smaller proportions and everything that supports the engine. Uh, and I think it ultimately ended up hitting that, that nail on the head. Yeah, I mean... You also had the, the, the time pressure, you know, and also the pressure of being the second builder because Custom Works Zone were also in there. So different pressures to unveil this concept bike for the new big boxer motor. So what made you go for titanium and, and where did the inspiration for the full birdcage come from? Uh, well, it actually, uh, most of the inspiration comes from BMW's heritage with uh, the Hene BMW that set so many records back in the 30s and 40s. Um, that basic outline of uh, the, really the, the handlebars is where you can see the, the bulk of the design. But since you've already got a boxer engine uh, that was developed, you know, even before that, uh, to me, it almost almost mimics that those lines specifically. But then there's the pressure to create something that isn't like that. So in other words, I didn't want it to be too on the nose. I didn't want it to be too obvious that that's what it was without telling the story. Uh, so picking modern materials um, and modernizing vintage motorcycles is what I specialize in personally. Uh, and then avant-garde uh, kind of brown, groundbreaking design is what I try to focus on and, and is always my goal. Uh, but with this specific project, I don't know. I, don't, I can't even say where it all came from. It was just a, a few late nights in the workshop staring at the engine uh, in gearbox and coming up with some overall concepts. And it just, it just went that way. Yeah, well, the end result is truly spectacular. Congrats to you. And hopefully we'll come back and talk to you about this project in more detail in a future episode. But what I want to know now, though, yeah. is, is your reaction to the series production R18, because you got to see that, I think, for the first time in South Africa a couple of months ago. And, and of course, it looks yeah. so different to what you made. But to finally see it in the metal, 
it must have seemed like the end of a long journey to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there's me writing it. Um, uh, to get the chance to ride it as a much more refined uh, production style motorcycle was was pretty cool. Um, uh, the the version I have, the engine is the same, but what I turned it into runs very rough and very loud, and it, it, it's quite different. Doesn't it doesn't feel refined uh, other than its power delivery. So to get to ride a bike that I knew I could actually ride across town or go all the way across the country was pretty cool. I think the the bike is uh, the part that I remember the most is that it doesn't it doesn't feel heavy or cumbersome. It feels light and balanced and uh, certainly refined and comfortable, which is what BMW is really known for. So uh, in, in that respect, I think uh, the goal is achieved. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, you're an American, so will the R18 fit right in when it arrives in the States in September, according to Trudy? I think so. I think so. I think it will fit in great. I think uh, anybody that wants to take a long road trip or even a short uh, uh, trip through the twisties will more than certainly appreciate uh, the way this bike has been built uh, and certainly the visual statement it makes about the rider. Brilliant. Thanks for all your insights, Alan. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, yeah. albeit briefly, and hope we get to go into a bit more detail in a future podcast. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Let's move up the East Coast now and join Kate Nettesheim. It's great to meet you, Kate. Pleasure to meet you as well. Yeah, I know, I know Peter. Hello, Peter. He's, of course, been collecting BMW bikes for, I think, more than four decades, as Tommy said earlier. But So what's it like growing up with a father with such an amazing passion for classic BMW bikes? And I want to know, where did he put them all? Well, you know, when, you, when you're put on a motorcycle before you, you can drive a car, you know that there's something to be said about that. So, um, you know, I pretty much grew up with it since I was a very, very little girl. Um, most of the time it was uh, my dad joking around about putting bicycle, you know, motorcycles inside my bedroom even when I was still living there. So that was, uh, that was always a fun, fun point of uh, contention between a young teenage girl and her father. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, my dad would just be meticulously filling every space for the bike, but obviously leave just enough room so that you could still walk around the bike and enjoy it. Um, and then I remember still as a kid in his... Um, workshop at uh, his business, I would be walking around this dusty truck bay and I would find dusty old motorcycles in a corner and friends in Germany have a bike that's waiting to be shipped over um, to the United States and I just feel like his collection is, is all over the world, not just here in New York. It's really amazing to see how many people have their hands involved in it at this point. Yeah, and how many people would want to uh, come and visit as well. It just looks incredibly amazing. Of course, we've seen you pop sure. up in a couple of the episodes of the Bavarian Soul Story. Um, most recently when the crew visited the museum which, and Tommy was blown away by that as you <laughs> could see he was completely blown away by that and then Very. you all went out for a ride you all went out for a ride on a variety of BMW bikes and, and for me personally it was it was amazing to see all those different decades out together on the road so it must have been something special for you to have actually been there on the day and been part of that yeah, sure. I mean, you know, being on the road and being with Roland and Tommy and all these people that I've heard about and maybe spoken to briefly in the past, actually be on the road with everybody was was a really amazing experience. You know, there was this moment where the sun was just going down and this thought kind of came into my mind that, you know, my dad's passion and, and his um, drive to to um, restore these bikes really is what influenced that moment. So now you have a you know, you're 1928 um, on the road, you have your 1931 on the road, I have my 1958 on the road, and you're kind of just watching history in motion at that point. And it was really, really something um, special because it's not too often you get to ride with a group of people on, on these uh, vintage motorcycles. No, it, it was special to see, it really was. And, and you mentioned passion there because, of course, anyone who knows your dad will understand that he's not only a collector, but he's also an expert brand historian. He's got all the skills to restore and catalogue these priceless bike so in terms of that passion did some of it rub, rub off on you along the way sure I mean you know I'm always amazed by the amount of information that my my dad can store in his memory um, it's, it's pretty much just endless at this point um, and I do not have nearly the same mechanical inclination that he does naturally um, but you know over the years we've, we've worked together um, on some projects just to um, 
you know, because I, I would like more insight into what he does and what he can accomplish with these bikes. And we've done things from lacing and truing wheels, self maintenance to ignition timing. And um, it's been a great bonding experience, you know, as well. Um, he's taught me a lot. He's gotten frustrated with me at times, for sure, because sometimes I have no idea what he's talking about because it's way complicated over my head. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's really great because now living back on Long Island in New York, we get to spend so much time together. and. I really get to learn about these incredible machines and, and really get to listen to his story because every single one of those things in that garage, in this museum, in his life has some sort of story attached to it. And that's, that's really, to me, some of the most interesting parts of, of the collection. Yeah, and it's not just about having bikes in a museum to look at, but it's using them, it's riding them. So I'm sure. interested to know... I'm interested to know, that I'm sure you've ridden a lot of them, maybe most of them, but I'm interested to know which ones stand out for you the most, Kate. Well, I, uh, I'm i lucky to have been able to ride a handful of them. I usually don't ask because I'm afraid I'm going to break something, so let's be very clear on that. <laughs> um, but uh, i got to say my, my favorite bike is definitely um, the uh, 1958 R50 that I, I typically ride. Um, but I did have an experience on an R52 from 1928 that my dad recently um, uh, came into owning. And this bike is, is not restored. It's all original. Um, and the story behind it is that there was a, an old Italian man who rode this thing throughout um, Italy for 40 plus years. Um, and it's still in its original condition. It's got the old beat up saddlebags. It's got little badges from all over the world on it. Um, and, you know, I wish, uh, I wish that we could kind of go back in time and talk to this guy about his stories. But what's incredible is that after 92 years, the bike kicks over and starts. And it just has that boxer mm -hmm. putt putt. You know, it's, it's this gallop. It's still there. I mean, it's the life in the bike is still there. And it's amazing to just have that story connected to it. So that, that to me, is one of the more special bikes that I've ever done. I mean, I can clearly see your passion for history there. and Yeah, 92 years. And, and why is it always everybody else who finds those barn finds apart from me? How many barns can there be yeah. left in existence <laughs> with motorcycles still in them that, that people are going to find? It's incredible, isn't it? But, but of course, you know, the R18, it's an all-new bike built to enter a new segment. So how well, in your opinion, do you think BMW has used its past heritage to seek inspiration for the way that you know, this bike looks? Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, when I first saw that bike, I thought BMW really embraced their history, both mechanically and visually. Um, the bike really hits on those five icons, which I want to quiz Tommy on right now, but I won't because I made him do it about eight times. <laughs> We're all shooting together. <laughs> um, but, you know, when I, when I first saw the bike, it was almost like we were uncovering a new piece of BMW history, and that, that was really... Um, an interesting moment, you know, it, it kind of connected all the dots. I'm just thinking about testing Tommy on the five icons, but I can't do that. Oh, Tommy. no, don't. do it. He knows it. It's, 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 early, it's early in the morning, and I'll go on then, Tommy. Come Good on, stripes. Go for it. Gas okay, tank. You're live. Frame. Boxer motor. Hold that was on. four. Was it Black and white. That five or Black five? and white. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good enough. Okay, back to Kay anyway. So, yeah, let's just talk very briefly about South Africa, Kay. How did it feel to be invited right. to, to, down to South Africa to join the crew again and actually be among the first to ride the R18 down on the Cape? Sure. Well, Natalie knows at first I thought she contacted me by accident. <laughs> so I was <laughs> shocked that I was invited. Um, I was so excited. And, um, you know, getting down there and really stepping off the plane and meeting all these wonderful people and all these cast and crew that we were going to be working with for the next, you know, two weeks was um, really an amazing experience. And knowing that we were going to be riding these incredible machines on these incredible roads was even, even more exciting um, without even having seen the bike yet. And I think that's another thing is that I think a lot of people don't realize that the scene of us walking into that warehouse is genuinely the first time that we saw those bikes the entire time. And that was so special and really, um, really resonated on the rest of the trip because it was really this moment of excitement. It wasn't just that we saw it in a tent or, you know, or anything like that. I mean, the first time walking through those doors was um, mind-blowing, really, really, and just kept the life alive the whole time we were shooting. And then 
you got to ride them. So just you know, tell me, just just describe you know how the power delivery is and the sound and and how I don't know how it stirred your soul. You know, just tell us about it. Yeah, well, you know, coming from a 500 cc bike and riding something more than three times the power um, can be a little bit intimidating. But I was absolutely shocked as to how smooth and responsive the throttle was, how smooth the ride was, um, and you know, the bike really feels like a part of you. Um, and for me, it, it just I felt a lot of the almost like my dad's hard work and dedication to the brand in that. Um, you know, and just kind of made me reflect on all the experiences that I had in the past. And, um, you know, in a world that's so disconnected today, it made you just kind of reconnect with yourself and, and reconnect with the world around you, which I thought was really, um, really important. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Kay. That's a really, really interesting anecdote there. And please say hi to your dad for me. So let's introduce a couple of questions to the group that have come in from our fans who are watching by the miracle of modern technology, hopefully we'll be able to bring one or two of them up on the screen. Okay, <laughs> I guess this one's for you, Natalie. Why is the Bavarian soul story so called? That's an easy one. Actually, it took a while until we decided how to call it. Um, we are, first of all, playing with the word soul a lot because this is just the word that describes the bike the best. Um, but I knew that if you, for example, call it just soul story, it doesn't stick to your mind. Like I needed something more special. And also, of course, like the U.S. is a very important market for us. We're an inter international um, company, so it for sure had to be an English name. But I also wanted to make sure that we don't forget where we come from. So I definitely knew that we need to combine it with some Bavarian something. And then after a long brainstorming, we came up with that Bavarian soul story. <laughs> Nailed it. Perfectly logical. Perfectly logical. <laughs> That's um, a good answer as well. Okay. <laughs> let's have another let's have another question. Question for Alan from Andy Reid. Okay, so is the R eighteen better with short bars or ape hangers? I think it all depends on who you are and how you like to ride. I think that um <laughs> actually as pointed out by Tommy when it was hot that the air conditioning of having your arms like this was pretty cool uh, so literally cool <laughs> um, but you know it gave Tommy that really tough look and uh, I'm only slightly taller than Tommy but I did I did find myself liking the, the look of you know this 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 high bar but I can't say which is better I think I think it depends on the rider completely Fair enough, yeah. I love the ape hangers. I think we've got time for one more because I've just uh, glanced at my watch and I've kept you guys talking for nearly an hour. So let's just have one final question for now. Okay, well, this is going to be for Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> what was the funniest moment during the filming of the YouTube series? And that's from Lars. That's from Lars. Second name I can't pronounce. Sorry. <laughs> um, I would... The funniest moment, man, if we could have a bloopers reel of everything that's happened on set, it would Can't be we? so entertaining. <laughs> yeah, we, Natalie, maybe, maybe we could have a little behind the scenes bloopers reel, talk to the crew. Um, honestly, <laughs> I think one of the funniest scenes that I've, I've seen kind of on camera that I can remember is we were in Edgar's office talking about design. He was like, how was your weekend? And... I'm like, oh, it was great. I went for a ride and this, that, and the other thing. And he instantly started speaking German to me. And I was just like, <laughs> I think you said food and beer. I'm not 100% sure. And he was just like, and he just looked at me with a straight face. And I just remember watching that on the playback and just <laughs> laughing hysterically till tears because he just looked at me straight face and he knows that I don't speak German. And it was just, it was one of those moments where there was a translation break. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm just going to roll with this and keep it. <laughs> And you didn't know Edgar that well by then. It was, I think, the second shooting day, so you were not too comfortable yet. That was funny. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, okay. Edgar, Edgar is absolutely hilarious, and it was there's so many jokes that Edgar has cracked on screen and off screen yeah. that have just been amazing. <laughs> you can't forget about the map scene. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was that was another one. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag Tommy's yeah. friends. Mark. Hashtag Tommy. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you you've got some explaining to do here, Tommy. Hashtag Tommy friends. Oh, no. People are going oh. mobile phones all over the world. But uh, just some just of us got paid to be Tommy's friends. 
That's how huh? it works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's we we were sitting down in a in a reading uh, in Cape Town, kind of going through how the the episode was going to kind of transpire, and rather than just firing off everybody's name, they were like Tommy's friend one, Tommy's friend two, Tommy's friend three. So we just started having an internal joke uh, off screen and on screen that we were just like hashtag Tommy's friends. And it's turned into an actual <laughs> Instagram handle now called hashtag Tommy's friends. And we've been just putting hashtag Tommy's friends on most of our posts throughout the, the storyline of the Bavarian soul story now. So it's just an inside joke. And it's funny watching people just kind of crack up over it because now we have the group, the friend circle is just growing and growing and growing and growing <laughs> now at this point. It's, so it started so as just to clarify here just... too, it, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, is that everyone, if you follow hashtag Tommy's friends on Instagram, Tommy will pay you to be his friend. So everyone do it. <laughs> the checks will start coming. Yeah, because and, and, the thing is Tommy doesn't definitely. have friends. <laughs> This is true. This is true. I I think I think oh, BMW God. for now giving me giving now me at least friends. five friends. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for opening up my circle. Call me. <laughs> Call me. I need some money. Yeah. I I actually have now six phone numbers in my phone, and it's it's I don't even know what to do with myself anymore. Yeah, <laughs> six people out of the out of the eighty nine people who are on set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Oh. All right, you guys. Listen, that's all we got time for today. I'm afraid. Um, yeah. Well, listen. Even if you're not watching live, please continue sending your questions in, and we'll make sure they are all answered via the brand social media channels. And and if you want, you can uh, put a hashtag on them as well, uh, as I'm sure you will. So, thanks, Tommy, Kate, Alan, and Natalie, and Timo and Trudy earlier for sharing the joy of riding the R18. Of course, for sharing all of your passion for motorcycling in general. I've really enjoyed talking to you all, and please come back again soon. Um, before we leave, just wanted to remind you all out there, we'll be back with more live podca podcasts in a few weeks' time. I don't know what we're, gonna, what we're gonna be talking about yet, but hopefully we're gonna be talking about customization, design, technical details, connectivity, whatever. But if you've enjoyed listening today, then let us know. And if you want some more, don't forget to subscribe to uh, Ride and Talk. It's an audio podcast, uh, which you know you can just find that on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts from. And and finally, well, that's it from me, Andy Duke. So we're going to leave you with some tantalising impressions of the eagerly awaited R18. So stay safe, stay healthy, and take care out there. Bye for now.